Hello everyone and welcome to Dinky Toy Restorations. This time we have Dinky Toy number 198, the Rolls Royce Phantom 5. Dinky Toys number 198 appeared in November 1962. Here you can see the competition with Corgi Toys in that Dinky Toys now had windows and suspension although this one boasted to be the first with opening windows. A gimmick too far perhaps. The upper part has been overpainted with silver. The original colour was a pale metallic sage green. I was not able to match this colour and the nearest I got proved to be less green than the cap suggested. But I liked it so I decided to go ahead with it nonetheless. Some silver paint has splashed onto the glazing and the rudimentary mascot is missing from the radiator. I was going to replace the casting for this but in the end I decided to go with what I've got. The strip down starts in the usual way by drilling out the three rivets that hold the base plate. I have drilled the rivets earlier and removed the four windows and a small piece of sponge that holds the thin plastic interior in place. The seats, the chauffeur and the steering wheel are joined together. I have also carefully drilled the head off the roof rivet holding the main glazing piece in place. The radiator casting has a moulded long rivet that passes through the block in the body casting. I have drilled the top of this off as well. Finally the two lights that are in the body casting can be prized out or popped out from behind. Uh, I've also removed these earlier. The main glazing piece has a scratch across the top but nothing that will show on a finished vehicle. So I decided to clean the plastic parts using my ultrasonic cleaner. The main reason for this is that the plastic seating piece is thin and has become quite brittle with age. I gave it two three minute sessions in warm water with a couple of drops of dish soap added. I also included the tyres. They were in good condition and are the correct 14mm diameter. So I put them safely to one side and I will refit them later. In order to remove the silver paint from the glazing pieces I used Dettol. An hour or two in this should remove the paint. Check regularly. You don't want to leave it in too long. Dettol can soften plastic. As I mentioned the interior piece is very fragile. In fact I damaged it a little removing it from the body. It is also split around the driver figure I will use some tape to reinforce the splits and some epoxy glue to strengthen the area under the driver. Meanwhile it's time to strip the paint. I'm using caustic soda for this and this is the first time. It can be quite volatile so be very careful if you've not used it before. Just make sure you add the caustic soda to the water and don't overfill your container. I have now changed my container for a metal one. Thanks to Bob Willis, Corgi Restorations, for this advice. Thanks also to Peter Watts, David Welsh and Michael Haig. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Michael. And Les Bird for their safety advice too. You can read their comments if you wish on the Bedford Van video. With the castings free of paint and thoroughly washed, it's time to buff them up to remove any oxidisation and to prepare the surface for primer. Now into the spray booth for some light coats of Tamiya White acrylic primer.
with the primer finished I will wait 24 hours before applying the colour coats. Meanwhile I can check out the other parts. The interior plastic has been reinforced with Tamiya tape and the driver's position with the epoxy glue. The flat spring provides the suspension to both axles. It is a bit rusty, but it's not that bad. Cleaning up the base plate is next. I try to avoid stripping the base plate as I love to retain some of the history of the vehicle. I start the base plate clean up with 4-0 grade wire wool. I allow this to bring through a little of the raised lettering. When this is finished, I use the cotton bud and some brass black to chemically blacken any unwanted bare metal on the base plate, namely where the rivets were drilled out and on a moulded raised part on the front axle. These two silver marks are paint and won't be moved by the brass black. I will have to rub them back with some more steel wool. When I'm happy with the look of the base plate, I will seal it with a generous coat of acrylic floor polish. The next day I painted the first colour coat on the lower half. I used a number 62 light stone from the Steve Flowers range of cellulose paints. This is a perfect match for the original. Because I will need to mask over this for the second colour, I will leave it to dry for another 24 hours. I do like two-tone schemes, but they can be a bit tricky to paint. Twenty-four hours later and I'm ready to spray on the second coat. So the first coat must now be masked. There is a danger here that the masking tape will lift off the first coat when it's removed. This is why I give the earlier paint coats a good twenty-four hours to fully dry. This is a one millimetre flexible masking tape. I bought a reel of it some years ago, but please don't ask me for details. I have tried to contact my original supplier, but they closed shop several years back, and I don't know the manufacturer. If anybody can help and suggest an alternative, please comment below. I'd be most grateful. Fine tweezers and a wooden cocktail stick is a great help for positioning masking tape. The wooden stick helps push the tape into place and will not damage the paintwork. This stage is quite time consuming and it's a relief when it's completed.
The next step is to widen the masked area by applying narrow yellow Tamiya tape, making sure that you overlap the blue tape. This step is a lot easier, but still a bit fiddly. I stick each piece of tape on a small mirror before applying them. This lessens the grab of the tape and it reduces the chance of uh, pulling off the paint later. Finally, I mask off the rest of the lower half to protect every part that's not going to be sprayed with the second colour. As I mentioned, this is not the original factory colour. This is Halford Silver Lake, a metallic voxel colour in case you want to use it or in case you want to avoid it. I decided to use Alclad Lacquer Chrome Paint for the front and rear bumper castings. Alclad make a range of metallic finishes for modellers. Most, like this one, need to be underpainted first with gloss black. Alclad is useful as it comes airbrush ready. Sadly I did not make the best job of this and I had to touch up the paint a little later. I left everything to dry for another 24 hours. Despite my best efforts, when I removed the masking tape, a chunk of the light stone paint came away with it. Luckily the damage was confined to one door panel only. So after carefully cleaning up and masking off the door panel, I resprayed with the stone colour and let it dry. Again for another 24 hours. Meantime, all I could do was to prepare the clear plastic items. They were free of the paint, but lacked a little crispness. So I dipped them into a jar of the acrylic self-leveling floor polish. Then removed them and stood the main piece on tissue to drain excess varnish and propped the four side windows up using blue tack on the tissue to let them drain also. It's a good idea to cover them while drying to prevent dust spoiling the finish. The next day all was fine with the paintwork so I could begin the final assembly. Here are most of the components laid out. The first job was to stick the main glazing piece back with a small amount of epoxy glue. The front grille and bumper or fender can now be clipped or glued in place. I prefer to glue as I don't want it to drop out. The 
you will notice the sponge, which is all there is that holds the interior piece in place. It was in position for so many years that the shape of the underside of the seating has been imprinted. I will line this up in its original position when I attach the base plate. Once the glue has dried, the four opening windows can be slipped in place between the glazing piece and the body casting. There is a lip at the top of each window facing outwards. Make sure you put them in the right way round. Another fiddly job. The seating unit simply drops in and I've lined up the sponge on the underside of the seats. This is how it looked when I removed the base plate. The rear bumper or fender can be dropped in place. There is no need to glue this. Here you see me fitting the wrong tyres. By 1962 ribbed tyres were being used. I forgot I put the original tyres away after cleaning. A quick check of the box art and a search of the internet confirmed that the ribbed tyres were indeed correct. So they will be fitted by the time I get to the reveal. Nearing the final stage now, but I'd like to thank again Peter Watts for a tip on buying pop rivets as the source for the rivets I need. On searching I found they were available in black as well as the normal silver colour, so I bought some black ones. You'll only need to tap out the shaft, which no doubt will become useful in the future. So here we are finally securing the base plate with the epoxy resin and the new black rivets. I do quite like the look of these. The rubber band is to compress the sponge so that it holds the base plate close to the body casting. Once everything is dried, I painted the rear lights red, and they were painted on the original toy. Before I show the reveal, I would like to remind you what the Rolls Royce looked like before the restoration. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please like and subscribe in the normal way, and feel free to comment. I am working on more restorations, so I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.